He's waiving his right to be indicted. Is that correct, Mr. Pierce? Judge, that is correct. Mr. Oliver has executed a, a waiver of uh, presentation to the grand jury, uh, waiving his right to be indicted and having this matter considered by the grand jury. He has also, Judge, executed a waiver of trial by jury form, which I don't think the court has, but that's been executed. I'll hand it to your bailiff. Thank you. Ms. Farrell, it's my understanding that you have been assigned as a special prosecutor in this matter, and that you did uh, present this matter to a special grand jury. Is that correct? Uh, I have been assigned as a special prosecutor, Your Honor. I did not present the matter to a grand jury. The parties agreed, and I filed the bill of information this morning. Is that your understanding as well, Mr. Pierce? That is. It's my understanding that the defendant's going to enter a no contest plea with the stipulation to a finding of fact. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. That's correct. Okay. And that the counts would be count one, attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of the first degree, count two, simple assault, misdemeanor of the first degree, count three, unlawful restraint, misdemeanor of the third degree, and count four, unauthorized use of property, misdemeanor of the first degree. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Oliver, I'm going to ask you some questions on the, on the answer yes or no. How will you please stand? Judge, you want us at the podium or? Please stand right there, yes. Sir, have you been informed by your attorney and do you understand the nature of the charges to which you're pleading, which would be count one, attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of the first degree, count two, simple assault, misdemeanor of the first degree, unlawful restraint, misdemeanor of the third degree, and unauthorized use of property, misdemeanor of the first degree. Yes, sir. Do you understand each of the misdemeanors of the first degree may bring with them up to 180 days in jail and up to a $1,000 fine in court costs? Yes, Your Honor. Do you understand the misdemeanor of the third degree may bring with it up to 60 days in jail and up to a $500 fine in court costs? Yes, Your Honor. I do understand. Do you understand you do have a right to a trial in this matter, either to the court or to a jury? Yes, Your Honor. I do understand that. Are you waiving that right today, sir? Yes, ma'am. Sir, did you sign a certain waiver right to jury trial? Yes, ma'am. And did you do so voluntarily? Yes, ma'am. Sir, do you understand you have the right to confront and cross-examine witnesses against you? I do understand that too, Your Honor. Are you waiving that right? Yes, I am. And sir, do you understand you have the right to subpoena witnesses to come in and testify on your behalf? Yes, ma'am, I understand that. Are you waiving that right? I am, yes. And sir, do you understand it is the obligation of the prosecutor's office to prove you're guilty on the behalf of that Yes, ma'am. Are you waiving that right? Yes, ma'am. Sir, do you understand you're not required to testify against yourself? Yes, ma'am. Are you waiving that right? Yes, ma'am. And, sir, do you understand by entering a no contest plea with a stipulation to a finding of fact, you waive the right to appeal any issue that may have been brought up at trial? Yes, ma'am. And you are waiving that right, sir? Yes, ma'am. And, sir, you signed a written plea of guilty, or, I'm sorry, written plea of no contest waiver of rights document. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. four or five pages long? Yes, ma'am. Did you sign this document voluntarily? Yes. Did you review this document thoroughly with Mr. Pierce? Yes, I did. Do you have any questions at all regarding anything contained within this document? No, ma'am. Yes, sir, you are a U.S. citizen? Yes, ma'am. Sir, I've briefly gone over your rights with you. I know Mr. Pierce has gone over your rights with you. You've gone over them. Do you have any questions regarding your constitutional rights? No, ma'am. Do you waive those rights at this time? Yes, ma'am. And, sir, to the charge in count one of attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of the first degree, how do you plead? No contest. Sir, to count two, simple assault, misdemeanor of the first degree, how do you plead? No contest. Count three, unlawful restraint, misdemeanor of the third degree, how do you plead? <clears throat> no contest. And count four, unauthorized use of property, and misdemeanor of the first degree, how do you plead? No contest. And you are stipulating to a finding of fact, is that correct? That's correct, Judge. Counsel, will you please read the facts into the record? Yes, Your Honor. First, that all of the four offenses were committed as a result of Mr. Oliver's misconduct in public office as defined in Revised Code 2901.13C1A. And would Your Honor find on the record the, uh, that the defendant was a, a peace officer at the time? I will find that he was a peace officer. officer at the time. Under Ohio Revised Code 2929.43. Thank you, Your Honor. For count one, 
the attempted theft in office misdemeanor in the first degree, that the defendant was selling his wares during his duty day, that there was money missing from the squad car cash payments when it was parked in front of the Internet Cafe, $804 cash was taken by the defendant when he held an illegal silent gun auction, and that the defendant took $500, which was a cash donation, meant for a charity with no accounting for where that money went. The assault, or for the assault on Ms. Crystal Casterline, you will hear from her, Your Honor. The unlawful restraint is for physically restraining Ms. Casterline and pushing her into a room despite her pleas to be let go. And finally, the unauthorized use of property, misdemeanor in the first degree, for taking the four previously referred to weapons that were um, on the sheet as evidence to be destroyed or used for law enforcement purposes, and instead of following that, use them without consent in an unlawful silent gun auction for the purpose of obtaining cash money from the officers and a weapon for himself, which he traded in for a larger weapon. Those are the facts, Your Honor. Mr. Pierce, do you agree with those facts? With the reading of the facts? Judge, we, we would consent to the court making a finding of fact. The court will make a finding of fact, find that the defendant is a peace, was a peace officer at the time of this incident, and based on the reading of the facts, the court will find the defendant guilty of count one, attempted theft in office, misdemeanor of first degree. Also, the court will make a finding of guilty on count two, simple assault, misdemeanor of first degree, based on the reading of the facts. Based on the reading of the facts, the defendant will be found guilty of count three, unlawful restraint, misdemeanor of the third degree. And count four, unauthorized use of property, misdemeanor of the first degree, the defendant will be found guilty based on the reading of the facts. At this time, the court will proceed with sentencing. Uh, before the court sentences the defendant, I'd like to hear from the defense counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Oliver, as I think everybody in this room knows, uh, served the township of Brimfield first as a police officer uh, and later as a chief. He served approximately 10 years as the chief of police. Uh, as everyone knows, Brimfield is a small town that has its own small town politics. Uh, I think politics have played a role in this case. Uh, and Mr. Oliver is at a point where he has decided that it would be in his best interest and the best interest of his family to resolve these matters with no contest pleas to misdemeanor offenses. Uh, he's done that for both his sake and his family's sake. Um, I know that there are going to be statements made in this case uh, by, I think, Ms. Casterline. I think, as everyone's aware, there is a civil suit that is pending that Ms. Casterline has filed against both Mr. Oliver and Brimfield Township. Uh, there will be more litigation to come, but uh, Mr. Oliver's motivation in resolving these is to attempt to achieve some closure for both himself and his family. This has been an extremely rough time for them. And, and I would indicate Mr. Oliver has done a lot of good for the community. Some of that good is, is a matter of public record some of the charity work that he's done, some of the proceeds from, from his book that was referenced. Um, there are some David Oliver supporters. I suspect that a lot of people in this room today are not here to support him. Uh, but Mr. Oliver is um, certainly uh, willing and wanting to move on with his life and his family's life, and that was the motivation for these pleas today. Mr. Oliver, would you like to make a brief statement? Your Honor, I was Chief uh, for the Brentfield Police Department for 10 years, 10 months. There was a collective bargaining contract in place for the entire time I was there. There was never one grievance filed. Never one. This year we entered into some pretty tense, I'm sorry, in 2014 we entered into some pretty intense contract negotiations where I requested pay cuts from the officers due to a 
increase in insurance. The officers refused to take that that cut, and, and negotiations got pretty tense. Nothing was said about any of this. Some of this information dates back to 2012. I mean, I. I one question, and I'm not going to be long, Your Honor, but one question I would ask is if there was a sworn police officer who thought there was a crime that had been committed in 2012, why didn't he report it? The secondary thing about this is I never heard anything about a hostile work environment or assault or I will guarantee you that Crystal punched me as, as much as I punched her. That's, that's the relationship we had. Her children spent the night with me and my family numerous times, all the way up to September 2014. Then we had the layoff notices came out and she was on the list. And as soon as we worked out the contract and rescinded the layoff notices, two days later, I got the hostile work environment charge and a threat from the union for a no confidence vote. There is no way in the world that I could have brought this case to a jury with three or four police officers, what they were going to testify, and run the risk with the jury. I, I just couldn't do it. So this whole thing befuddles me. I, I've never seen anything like it. There are officers here today who used to work for me show, that, that have shown up just to grind it. One that I fired, well, I mean, when you are the boss, you don't make a lot of friends. So, Mr. Oliver, you you did stipulate to the facts in this matter. I did. The facts as they were written on paper by other officers. And I want to stay with a no contest plea, Your Honor. I'm doing it with a clear mind. Anything else, Mr. Pierce, you'd like to say on behalf of the defendant? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Tomorrow, I know that there is an agreement here between counsel and yourself relative to sentencing. Would you like to say anything? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Before I introduce Ms. Kesterlein, um, <clears throat> I would like to say that perhaps Mr. Oliver should question um, what kind of leadership skills he used with those people that they were too afraid to come forward until my office showed up to investigate. And people were more than happy to tell us about his crappy, horrible, deplorable behavior. He makes no apologies today. He has no remorse for what he put those people through. It's astounding, Your Honor. He abused his office, his public office, in two different ways. First, the financials, which I've already run through, Your Honor, where he used it for his own personal gain. He blurred the lines between what belonged to the police department and what belonged to him. But more importantly, he abused mentally and physically an officer that was his subordinate. It was his job to foster her law enforcement career. It wasn't his job to make her feel horrible daily, physically and mentally. Today would like you to hear from Ms. Casterline. I know you've read some other letters that have been submitted, Your Honor. I have. Yeah. And are there any trustees here who would also like to speak to? Or? I don't believe so, Your Honor. Council trustees. Okay. Ms. Casterline, I will allow her children to accompany her to the um, podium. I'm asking all the news media not to picture the children at all. If she wants to bring her children in. That's probably a wise move. You come forward. Just state your full name, Crystal, and spell your last name before I Officer Crystal Lynn Casterline, C A S T E R L I N E. Before I start, um, even now, after everything that he's done, 
and after all of the officers came forward and said what they saw firsthand, what they witnessed, when he was pleading no contest because he didn't even have the integrity to admit the guilt he has. He turned around, Your Honor, and he glared at me. Even now, he attempts to intimidate me. And I would be lying if I said he wasn't successful because for three years, he has laid that groundwork. And unfortunately, it still exists. But I was not allowed to have a voice before, and I am so grateful that you've allowed me to have that voice now. In nine hours, I will be standing in a courtroom trying to express how deeply my life and the lives of everyone close to me were affected by David Oliver. The idea of a victim's impact statement seems insurmountable. How do I explain what happened to me and how deeply it changed me in a brief statement? Well, the answer is I can't. I am not David Oliver's only victim, and the lives he's damaged, altered, and tragically changed can't be measured in a single statement. When I began working in Brimfield, I was so excited. I wanted to really help people. I wanted to make a difference. In the beginning, I felt as though David Oliver shared my passion for helping others and really changing the way cops were viewed by the public. I was so excited about every aspect of police work and extremely proud to be part of the profession. I remember feeling embarrassed in my initial interview when they asked my opinion on the Facebook page. I told them that I didn't know about it and red-faced apologized for not having done a little more research. They chuckled and stated that it wasn't a bad thing, me not knowing. Over the next two years, the Facebook page exploded and the sanctity of the station, my home base, melted into the scariest, most unsafe place for me to be. It started slowly with a hug. In those first few months, I felt so unsure of myself and my abilities as a police officer. I had never been a road officer, and it seemed that what I didn't know by far outweighed what I did. Oliver was amazing in the beginning, constantly encouraging and praising me. Oliver was always asking me about my calls and then reassuring me that I was handling them well. If my supervisor questioned a decision, Oliver was the first one to jump in and defend me. I began to think of Oliver as not just my boss, but my friend. His wife befriended me, and my daughters fell in love with his daughter. My daughters even stayed the night at his house one time. He even insisted on my girls calling him Uncle Chief. My girls liked him. I liked him. My dream had come true, and I was a police officer. I loved my community. Oliver's treatment of me began causing problems. I was not following chain of command by talking to Oliver about questions on calls or concerns and issues. My supervisor was under, undercut by Oliver when trying to teach or correct me. I tried to explain that the chief was approaching me with questions, not the other way around, but it was already driving a wedge creating frustration and isolating me from the very people I needed to learn from. I look back now and realize how very naive I was at the time. I just didn't see it. I was so eager to learn and felt so unsure about what to do at times. Looking back, I can understand the frustration and the resentment my supervisors must have felt. The chief was constantly building me up because I tend to be my harshest critic. Many times I would be so unsure, but the chief was someone that I could trust and come to at any time with any question. And with me, he strongly encouraged me to use his open door policy. I loved my job. I loved putting on my uniform, loved the people I worked with. They weren't just coworkers. They quickly became my family. When I started working at Brimfield Police Department, I never understood domestic violence. I never got why the person stayed or why they just didn't leave. Once again, I was painfully naive. I remember the first time David Oliver hugged me. It made me uncomfortable. I really liked him, but I wanted to make sure that the boundaries were clear. When I first started at Brimfield, another female officer tried to warn me. She told me to watch the chief and explain that he could get physically way over the line. He was very handsy, she, she, she said. I reassured her that I don't do that kind of thing, so I'd be fine. Maybe that's why I got that sick feeling in my stomach with that first hug. To this day, I don't know. But even though it was uncomfortable for me, I spoke up that first time. 
and every time thereafter. I clearly told Oliver that I didn't want him to hug me and that it made me very uncomfortable. I didn't realize that he'd been setting the stage for a while, but looking back, it seemed so obvious. I had come to view my abilities and success as a police officer through his approval or disapproval. I trusted, respect, admired, and listened to him. Things dissolved quickly. The hugs escalated to groping, humping me, trapping me places, and forcing me into positions where he would press his body into mine, forcing me to dance with him, restraining me for long periods. He would rub his hands all over my face and pull my hair out of its ponytail. He was constantly asking me extremely personal questions about my sex life, sexual orientation, specific details about sexual partners and sexual experiences in front of other officers. He would text my personal phone and ask me what I was wearing. He would humiliate me by going into detail about how he would train me if I were his wife. I was resistant every time, initially just verbally, but as he became more physically aggressive, I began to physically fight back as well. And you are right, I did punch you. I began to physically fight back, but it didn't seem to matter. What I said or what I did, he would not stop. He began being physically violent without warning, punching me hard enough on many occasions to knock me to the ground. On multiple occasions, pressure pointing me, pinching me, leaving bruises all over my arms and legs. As things were escalating physically, they were also escalating verbally. He would berate and humiliate me daily, almost telling me I was worthless and a waste. He began criticizing everything I did, constantly changing rules or contradicting a new rule the following day after it was made. He became so explosive and unpredictable that I simply tried to avoid him at all costs. I started believing the things that he was saying and felt as though if I could just do better and make him happy, that he would go back to being my friend. It was so confusing, and I didn't understand why I couldn't make him happy. I became so fearful on station, but the only place I could write my reports was on station. I began coming in off duty on midnight shift to complete my reports in a desperate effort to avoid Oliver. It worked for a little while. I would stay away from the station all day patrolling, responding to calls, and doing house checks while the chief was there. And at night, when it was safe to come back, I would go back to work off the clock and write reports from that day. Somehow, Oliver found out about my off-duty report writing and threatened to fire me if I did it again. Other officers often came in off-duty, even when Oliver was working to complete reports, and it was never an issue. I couldn't understand his anger at my doing it. Now it seems so obvious, but I just didn't see it. He was removing my only place to hide. I requested that I be moved to another shift, and another officer even agreed to switch with me. Oliver denied it. I still kept thinking I could fix it, I could improve, or do something to make things go back. I tried everything. I went to my union rep. He told me that in the first year I could be fired for anything and had no union backing. I went to my supervisor. He understood my desperation. He had witnessed it firsthand. But in the end, his hands too were tied, as he reported it to his supervisor. I just thought, I have to make it through the first year, if I can just get through probation. My health was steadily slipping. I began having constant anxiety, difficulty concentrating. I was unable to sleep. My whole world became about the department. I was a ball of nerves. When I wasn't there, I was worrying about what would happen during my next shift. I so desperately wanted to be accepted, to be tough, to be one of the guys. I didn't want to be thought of as weak or helpless. The hardest part about the humiliation well, it was Oliver's love of an audience and his twisted need to do almost all of these things in front of my fellow officers. It only added to the feelings of helplessness and shame. Not one of the supervisors or officers at Brimfield Police Department ever condoned, encouraged, or joined in Oliver's abusive behavior. In fact, quite the opposite. They were appalled by his actions and tried to encourage and console me afterwards. To his 177,000 Facebook followers, he was the model police chief, father, husband, and man. But inside the station, he was a sadistic, manipulative sociopath. I was living a nightmare for so long. The end of my one year marked the finish line if I could only get there. In February, 10 months after I started at Brimfield, I had what I believed was an asthma attack. I was rushed by squad to the closest hospital. I was unable to breathe on my own and placed on a ventilator. I was in ICU for nearly a week. 
I had never been hospitalized prior to that for anything relating to asthma, but that was just the beginning. I had multiple attacks, the most severe shortly after the first hospitalization. I had another attack. The last thing I remembered was my 11-year-old daughter and her best friend trying to help me downstairs as I was struggling to breathe. While my four daughters, ages 11, 9, 8, and 6, watched in horror, I slowly stopped breathing. 911 attempted to talk my mother through CPR as she tried to resuscitate me. I remember regaining consciousness as EMTs were getting ready to transport me via ambulance. They took me to the closest hospital to stabilize me, and I was then transported by ambulance to Akron City, where I stayed for almost another week. There were many more attacks after that, but I made it to the finish line one year. Later, I found out that it was not asthma, that it was something called vocal cord dysfunction that was brought on by the extreme trauma and distress I was experiencing. However, after that first year, nothing changed. Because of a general order issued by the chief, I could not report anything to the trustees. We were all bound to a code of silence with our jobs as leverage, and everyone else already knew what was happening. The sergeants attempted to intercede on my behalf. It didn't help. The captain even spoke with the chief regarding his conduct, but it only made things worse for me. The prior union rep had left for another department. I approached the new union rep. He tried to help, but ultimately relayed that I had no recourse through the union. They suggested I get an attorney. I had bitten, punched, scratched, kicked, and even stabbed Oliver during altercations, trying to get him off of me. His almost daily unwanted physical advances and attacks were always met with adamant verbal responses that I didn't like it or want it or enjoy it. I told him over and over that he was making me uncomfortable. But the physical assaults and sexual harassment continued on, on an almost daily basis for two years. I became more and more withdrawn and depressed. I truly felt there was no way out. Then I had another attack and hospitalization. I was informed that I needed to figure out what was happening, what was causing them before it was too late. The day I was released from the hospital, I met with an attorney and begged her to help me. Looking back, I can't imagine what Nancy must have been thinking that day meeting me for the first time, but thankfully she agreed to help me. She wrote a letter to the trustees and told them what was happening. They launched an internal investigation and the people I work with told the truth in spite of the risk it posed to their own jobs. During the five-week investigation, Oliver continued to intimidate and bully me. I stood my ground while my accusations were substantiated by my coworkers who witnessed Oliver's criminal behavior. The trustees handed down a two-week suspension as punishment. I was terrified. I knew when Oliver returned, he was going to either destroy my credibility and fire me, or that he would seriously hurt me or get me killed on a call. I had no choice but to go public. I felt like I was falling further into despair daily. There were hate sites ridiculing me, people threatening me publicly, making up lies about me and my family. My address was published on one of the sites. My children's pictures were placed on the sites as well. Some of the threats were so severe I had to contact police. My house was vandalized. My privacy was non-existent. My children were teased at school. They were devastated and heartbroken when they found out what was happening to their mother. I couldn't escape the public scrutiny. It was on the radio, all over the news, in the papers for weeks, and a year later it's still controlling a huge part of my life. Six months after coming forward, I was still sinking. Going back on station was like being trapped in a nightmare. Every corner of that station held a memory and a frightening experience. I began feeling so despondent and hopeless. My home was still a source of harassment. I received threats towards my children with no stamp in my mailbox. My house was vandalized, my mail was stolen, and as a result, the post office had to hold my mail, creating a daily reminder of Oliver's destruction in my life. I became so resentful of those daily mail picks up, pickups driving to the post office. I would sit down to write a report and be frozen in panic. His presence so real, even though he was gone, I flinched when my children hugged me and felt such self-loathing seeing the hurt and rejection flicker across their faces. My life had been reduced to a list of the least awful choice. My four little girls that have such big hearts and so much courage had become angry and defensive. I felt so lost and so hopeless. I began feeling my only way out, the only way to spare my girls from this new defective broken mother was to end my life. I felt that ultimately I would be sparing them and ending my own constant suffering. 
I reached levels of depression and pain that I didn't know existed. But sometimes God plan God's plan is louder than our own, and I am still here. It's now almost 4 a.m., and I'm reflecting on how David Oliver's bullying, verbal abuse, physical assaults, sexual harassment, and degradation has impacted me. I've gone through three years of hell, been publicly ridiculed and shamed. I spent the last month trying to discourage my daughters from making victims' impact statements, ultimately being forced to choose between exposing them to the hostility and ugliness I personally experienced or having them see me as the person did, that denied them a voice. I am a single mom, and I have been on unpaid leave for six months. David Oliver is working full time and making nearly as much as he made before. Nothing has changed in his world. I have been very vocal that I do not support this plea. I think David Oliver should be held to a higher standard because of his position, not receive a get out of jail free card because of it. He committed many felonies and changed who I am forever. When David Oliver met me, I was happy and energetic. I was a marathon runner. I loved life. I snuggled my little girls constantly, and I was naive. I was naive. I never understood domestic violence, how it gets that far, but I do now. It happens a little bit at a time. They lure you in, gain your trust, and build you up, and then they start breaking you down isolating you and destroying your self-worth. You wake up in a nightmare and don't know how you got there, and it's so hard to see a way out. I spent the last week watching four little girls struggle to find their voice and try to wrap their minds around things they shouldn't even know about, but because of David Oliver, they do. I had to convince a little girl that it was okay to forgive you and to let go of her anger and the betrayal. I had to plead with her to not let your poison eat away at her like it has to me. I have an amazing psychologist. I go to her multiple times a week for almost a year now, and I'm getting stronger all the time. But Oliver has had one court appearance, and it's being recommended that his punishment be court costs and fines. What message does that send to women, or the public, or my daughters? Why is my price for coming forward higher than his for committing numerous felonies, assaulting me, sexually harassing me, stealing, while in a position of extreme trust and power. Whatever happens to David Oliver today will not affect my healing or my happiness, because today it ends for me. This is not my sin to carry. It belongs to David Oliver. I am not David Oliver's only victim, but today I have a voice, and for that I would like to thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow, anything else? Nothing further from the state. And again, the state of Ohio has uh, investigated this matter. Ms. Grimm, please sit down. The state of Ohio has investigated this matter, and you feel that this is a fair resolution. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And you are recommending uh, community control sanctions. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, and Mr. Oliver will be surrendering his Ohio certificate today. Mr. Oliver, I've known you for quite some time. Um, I was thinking this morning about um, how I was involved in Shop with the Cops in Brimfield, and you were the head of that program, and the little children were so happy. They loved to be in the Shop with the Cops. And Love going to Applebee's. I, I'm thinking now how you let those little children down. You've let the people of Brimfield down. You've let your family down. You've let law enforcement down. You've become the moat that you wrote about in your book. Do you realize that? I'm going to take the recommendations of the uh, Assistant Attorney General in sentencing the defendant with uh, a proviso of probation, uh, just based on what she felt was appropriate and what uh, the, the attorneys agreed to. I hope this never happens again to anyone else. I hope no one else comes forward. That would be a huge letdown to everyone in law enforcement. On the attempted theft 
in office, misdemeanor of the first degree, I'm going to sentence the defendant to 180 days of Portage County Jail. On the simple assault, misdemeanor of the first degree, I'm going to sentence the defendant to 180 days of Portage County Jail. On the unlawful restraint, misdemeanor of the third degree, I am going to sentence the defendant to 60 days of Portage County Jail. On the unauthorized use of property, misdemeanor of the first degree, I am going to sentence the defendant to 180 days of jail. Those sentences will run concurrent to one another. I'm also going to assess the defendant a $1,000 fine and court costs. I will suspend the balance of the jail and $700 of the fine on the following conditions. First, you will be placed on basic probation here in Portage County for a period of 24 months. Second, you will pay your court costs and fines within 24 months. If you cannot pay, I will allow you to do community work service of up to 40 hours a week at $10 per hour until paid in full. Your court costs are currently $121, so to work this off, you have to do around 42 community work service hours. You will pay restitution of $1,304 in 24 months through the Adult Probation Department here in Portage County to the victim, Brimfield Police Department. You will be persona non grata at the Brimfield Police Department and you will have absolutely no contact whatsoever, directly or indirectly, with the victim in this matter. Lastly, you will sur surrender your OPADA certificate under section 109.77 of the Ohio Revised Code. It's my understanding at this time you don't have the physical uh, certificate, but you are surrendering uh, your right to be a police, peace officer in the state of Ohio. Do you understand that, sir? Yes, ma'am. So if you violate any of these terms or conditions, I will impose the original jail sentence on each count to run consecutive to one another. Do you understand that? Yes, ma'am. Anything else at this time, Mr. Pierce? No, Your Honor, thank you. Anything else, Mr. Long? Not from the state, thank you. You'll need to go over to the adult probation program today and sign up with the probation department. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. 